Well, welcome back to Come and Dine, an invitation for you to participate in the Feasts of the Lord by learning how we as believers connect with the Old Testament and all of the things that the Lord has for us there. We're excited. We're on Lesson 10, the Feast of Tabernacles. I already gave part one of this message, and so if you didn't get to hear it, you'll want to go back and hear that. It is full of pictures of Christ and all that he's done for us, and I am excited to share this second part with you today. It's the most joyous feast, the feast that ended all feasts, and the birthday party of Jesus, which we'll talk about today. And so it pictures for us not only what he did in his first coming, but the kingdom to come when he comes back in his second coming. And so uh, you and I will celebrate this feast in the millennial kingdom every year, going up to Jerusalem, along with all those who will go to worship the Lamb who is the Lion of Judah, the Lord of all. And so I'm excited to share with you today all of the pictures that we have looking forward into that time that the Lord has given us. So as I shared with you last week, I am a kingdom girl at heart. And what that means to me is I long for the day when the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our Lord, Christ. I love what Elizabeth I of England said hundreds of years ago when she said, I wish I could be alive when Christ returns because I would like to be the first earthly monarch to take my crown and lay it at his feet. Having read the faith and heart of Queen Elizabeth II, I believe that she would echo those words as well in our time. What a day that will be when kings bow down. In fact, that's the first thing I want you to see today. Kings will bow down at Christ's second coming just as they did at his first coming, which was his birth. Look at what Psalm 72, 11 and 17 say. All kings will bow down to him and all nations will serve him. All nations will be blessed through him and they will call him blessed. When the Magi came and found Jesus after his birth in Matthew 2, they said this, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of frankincense and myrrh. So as I shared last week in detail, God set the timing of Christ's birth at the Feast of Tabernacles, just as he set the timing for Christ's death at Passover. And again, go back and listen to part one of the lesson, and I'll show you from the scriptures how Christ was in fact born during this Feast of Tabernacles, which would put the birth of Christ in the area of September, maybe early October at the latest. This is during this feast, remember, when God called his people to put up sukkahs, that is little tents or mini tabernacles. Uh, same word for stable that's used in the Bible, which is why I believe that God provided a stable for his, for his son to be born in during this feast, in keeping with the feast as all of God's people would be in these sukkahs. One thing I never saw, though, until this week, and I want you to look at it with me. Look at what the Lord says in Leviticus 23. On the 15th day of that month, the Lord's Feast of Unleavened Bread begins. Remember, Passover is a part of unleavened bread. The Lord's Feast of Unleavened Bread. Then look at verse 34. On the 15th day of the seventh month, the Lord's Feast of Tabernacles begins. Did you know this is said of no other feasts? And I didn't even see that until this week, even though I wrote this study 20 years ago and taught it then. No other feast. It is his Passover. It is his Feast of Tabernacles. Why? Because it commemorates his birth when he makes all things new and his death when he gives life. So let's look together again at this great feast, his feast, commemorating his birth and the rebirth of the new heavens and the new earth when he returns someday. As I've already said, it's the longest feast in the Jewish calendar year. It's the largest. It's the most joyous feast. And I am excited to share with you today these last gifts that I began with last week of all the marvelous things God has packed into this feast for you and for me. So let's pray and ask the Lord to bless this time. 
Father, we thank you for the mighty and majestic name of Jesus. We thank you for all that he has done for us in his mercy. We thank you that he is King and Lord of all, and he will return one day and rule and reign on this earth, making all things right and new. I thank you for all the pictures we will see today of that. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come and be our teacher. Guide us into truth. And as we sit at the Lord's feet, may you fill us to overflowing with joy and gladness and a spirit of reviving in our hearts to walk in all you have for us in these days as we await that day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I've already said, the Feast of Tabernacles was Jesus' birthday. So God, in fact, put in place, I believe, a birthday party for his son, and God's people were practicing this for hundreds of years before Jesus actually came. And like every birthday, a birthday comes with gifts, and so I see seven gifts in this feast. And as always, Jesus is the one who is giving, not the one who is receiving. So last week, we looked at the first three gifts. Let's just look at them quickly again together. We saw the gift of relationship, which is the first gift of this feast. As I told you, God with us, Emmanuel. Why did God put a tabernacle or a tent in the middle of his people? Because he wanted to live in their midst. He wanted to return as much as possible to Eden when he walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. As we see at the end of the book of Revelation, when he will live among us again, being our tabernacle in presence because he longs for relationship. And so during this feast, he asked his people to build sukkahs or tents again, these structures that were, uh, had three sides and were topped with palm branches that would remind them of the temporary structures that they were in when they journey from Egypt to the promised land and to remember his provision and his protection and most of all his presence there. So today, God's people build these sukkahs for the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot all over the world. And here are some pictures I showed you last week of these dwelling places that God's people will live in. It's happening right now in Jerusalem and around the world. So this is a great time for you and I to be talking about it, the gift of relationship, because he longs to be with us, Emmanuel, in every way. The second gift that came with this feast was a picture of the gift of redemption. So we talked about how key living water was in this feast. In fact, they dipped into the pool of Siloam and poured it out on the altar every single day, calling it living water. And we know that Jesus Christ stood in John 7 at this very feast and said, this is about me. I am the living water. If any man wants to come and is thirsty, I will pour this living water upon him. It will flow from his very being, the rivers of the Holy Spirit. They would also use palm branches uh, to wave and worship the Lord during this time. In fact, it was during the Feast of Tabernacles that this ceremony happened every single day. God's people actually lifted it from the Feast of Tabernacles and put it into Passover when they did this same thing when Jesus entered Jerusalem, crying out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, save us now. They were acknowledging the lordship, the kingship of Jesus, but as sometimes happens, he wasn't the king they hoped for. And so they ended up crucifying him. During this feast as well, we see the picture of water and wine that is poured out on the altar every single day in the same way that Jesus would pour out water and blood from his side when he completely redeemed us, the gift of redemption. It's pictured in this feast in such an incredible way. And then we see the gift of rest. We know that this feast uh, has Sabbath to Sabbath on, it, on each side, meaning that God wanted that sense of rest to be built into this feast. It reminds us that our rest comes through the work of Christ and Christ alone. There's nothing we can do to work for our salvation. We have complete rest in Him. And He wants us to live in that place of rest with Him and in Him as we walk with Him every day. We know that when he comes back in his kingdom, it's going to be time of peace on earth. And that's why the angel said to the shepherds when Christ was born, peace on earth, goodwill toward men on whom his favor rests. This sense of peace on earth will be a feature, a key feature of the kingdom when Christ returns. And so we see the gift of rest. Those three gifts we looked at in detail last week. Now let's look at the last four, seven gifts that the Lord gives us through this incredible feast of all feasts. So 
gift number four, the gift of revival, the gift of a revival. Now, when the glory of the Lord surrounded the shepherds at Jesus's birth and later the disciples at Christ's transfiguration, God was pouring out his fullness upon them as he longs to do for us through revival. This will again happen in his coming kingdom. And it's such a powerful picture. You'll see it in the prophets. Look at what Joel 2, 28 and 29 says. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. One of my favorite verses that pictures this in the coming kingdom in Habakkuk 2.14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the seas. Even as God filled his tabernacle, filled his temple with his glory, how he extended that to the shepherds when it said that the glory of the Lord surrounded them like a tabernacle, like a tent. And the disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration, again, the glory of the Lord surrounded mere men. This is a picture of the revival that the Lord wants to bring. He will bring it in the kingdom. But when you and I pray for this glory to come back to his people now, to come upon our hearts and homes and our churches, this is what we're crying out for, that his glory would be seen again in such a dynamic way. And so there are three pictures in this feast of this revival. The first is fresh wind. Each day of this feast, the priests would cut willow branches, some 25 feet in length, and then proceed back to the temple each day, waving them in multiple rows, creating the sound of a mighty rushing wind to represent the fullness of God's presence. This is how the Holy Spirit came to believers on Pentecost, filling them all. Acts 2 tells us that. And remember what an incredible picture this is because the Holy Spirit departed God's temple in the book of Ezekiel because of the wickedness of God's people. And then he returned in Acts chapter 2 when he came as a mighty rushing wind. And you and I are filled with that mighty rushing wind today as the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so this fresh wind is a picture of his work. Now the one who led this parade, this procession every day, while playing a flute was called the pierced one. Just as through the piercing of Jesus, we have received the indwelling of his Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing? Called the pierced one because actually a flute is pierced and that's the way that it makes music. And so they named it that, not knowing that they were foretelling what their savior would do for them. His spirit will again fill not only the temple and his people in the coming kingdom, but the whole earth. So how full are you of his spirit today? Do you need fresh wind in your sails? Then I want to invite you to ask for it. In Acts 2, he came as a mighty rushing wind. And do you know in Acts 4, when they went through some persecution, they were back in the upper room praying, crying out to God. And do you know what they asked for? A fresh filling of his spirit. They asked for boldness in the Lord. And it says that the place was shaken again and God filled them again. We go through fresh fillings. We should be asking for this all the time. The spirit of revival asks that a fresh wind would come. And I think we need to cry out for that today. Another gift, another picture that comes, that's a picture of revival through this feast, is refreshing rain. So this feast was a celebration of the rains that watered the harvest, as well as services of prayer for more rains to come. This was the only way that God's land was watered in the Holy Land. These rains picture Jesus in his early and latter, or first and second comings, and the spiritual harvests that would follow as well as picturing us returning to the Lord for revival when we are far from him. All of those themes are found in the book of Hosea, in Hosea 6, 3, when God's people say, Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us, that we may live in his presence. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge or know him intimately. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the latter rains, like the early rains, 
that water the earth. But because of sin and stubbornness and self-rule, God's people often experienced dry hearts and lives. Through repentance and returning, God longed to pour this living water upon them as he does upon us. This outpouring of water was a consistent picture of what he would do in the coming kingdom. You'll see it throughout the prophets. Look at what Isaiah 44, three through five says. For I will pour water on a thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. One will say, I belong to the Lord. Another will call himself by the name of Jacob. Still another will write on his hand, the Lord's, and will take the name Israel. How we need this reviving rain to fall upon our hearts, upon our homes, upon our kids, upon our land. I don't think I have ever seen women more desperate for a reviving rain to fall upon their children and bring healing and raise them up in the way they were taught. We taught them to walk in truth. And so many of them have been disillusioned with the church in the last several decades and have walked away. And we are desperate for this reviving rain to fall upon us once again. That is what the Lord wants to do so much in each of our hearts. And again, I would just encourage you, ask for it. Zechariah 10, 1 says, ask for rain in the proper season, ask for it. This is the proper season, sisters, to ask for rain, to fall upon our homes again. So as I told you, many believers flock to the Holy Land. They do this during Passover to experience the place where Jesus died for them. But many believers go during the Feast of Tabernacles as well. And those who go during this time get baptized often again there to demonstrate this refreshing outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And this is actually a picture of believers during the Feast of Tabernacles getting baptized or rebaptized and making this refreshing rain with their hands to call forth the Holy Spirit. It's a picture of revival. During the Feast of Tabernacles, work crews were sent out months in advance to build up the roads, to make them straight again, to remove any obstacles or stumbling blocks that would keep the pilgrims from walking a straight path to Jerusalem. That's what the prophet Isaiah talks about in Isaiah 40, when he says, prepare the way of the Lord, make ready, the paths. It will be called a, high, a highway of holiness for the people of God to come to Jerusalem and celebrate this feast in his kingdom. And he will do the same work in our lives now as we await his coming if we will ask for the reviving rains and live in his holy ways. Isaiah 35 talks about that highway of holiness. In fact, the entire chapter is about this feast and about the fulfillment of this in God's coming kingdom refreshing rain. And then we see the picture of fresh fire as a picture of revival during this feast. So there were four lights in the court of women of the temple that would be lit each evening of this feast. There was a party every night. High candelabras or menorahs, 75 feet high. And four young boys would climb tall ladders and pour out the oil that kept those lamps from going out. Wicks were made from the priestly linens, which they called swaddling cloths, another picture of the birthday of Jesus. And these enormous birthday candles shone so brightly there wasn't a home in Jerusalem that couldn't see the light. And I want to remind you that that is what God wants for us, that our priestly garments would be so saturated in the oil of the Holy Spirit that we would shine his light everywhere. And often it is children and our youth that spark the flames of revival, just as those little boys climbed that ladder and filled those bowls with oil. And we should ask the Lord to fall with power upon them as it falls upon us. As the temple of his Holy Spirit, you and I are that pillar of fire that brings light, hope, and warmth to the world right now. Someday in the coming kingdom, the Lamb will be the light and there will be no more night, Revelation 21 and 22 tells us. Somebody has well said that it is time for the Church of Jesus Christ to stop complaining about the darkness and turn on its light. Don't whine, 
shine. And I love what Isaiah 60, 1 and 2 says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. See, darkness has covered the face of the people in deep darkness, the earth, but the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Is that not talking about our time right now? Do not see this cloud of darkness and deeper darkness that has just engulfed this earth even in the last months as we've walked through this pandemic and so many other catastrophes in this world. But I want you to see what that says. It, it says, the Lord rises upon you, not he will rise upon you. He rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is in you. You are the temple of him and he goes forth with power. If you will clean out every last nook and cranny, every room in your heart, every place in your life that doesn't befit his glory and let him come with consuming power. And so this gift of revival is not just what we will experience in the coming kingdom. It's what God wants us to get hungry for now and cry out for. Ask the Lord for these things. Ask him for fresh wind. Ask him for the refreshing rains. Ask him for fire, fire to fall upon the altar of your life again, just as fire fell upon Solomon's altar in the temple and God's glory filled that temple so full that the priests couldn't even stay in it to minister. Wouldn't it be great if God came upon you with such fire that you couldn't even stay in your own space? Only God would pour forth everywhere that you go. So let's pray for that, the reviving, beautiful gift of this feast. Then we see the gift of rulership. The gift of rulership as Christ comes back to rule and reign. And we're going to talk now about the millennial kingdom and what will happen during this time in the eternal kingdom and why it's so important that Christ come back to an imperfect world to rule and reign the way that he should have been received in that role to begin with. So look at what Zechariah 14, 9 says. The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one Lord and his name, the only name. So I want to look with you at three aspects of this rule of Christ during this time. The first is it will be a righteous rule. It will be a righteous rule. So after Armageddon, only the redeemed will enter the millennium. Matthew 13, 49 and 50 tells us that. Revelation 19, 18 and 21. You can read those passages to see that those who stand against the Lord at the battle of Armageddon and everybody will take a stand. It says the whole earth comes out against the lamb. They will be slain with the word from his mouth, the sword of the spirit that comes out of his mouth when he returns with the saints. And only the redeemed will start the millennial kingdom with the Lord. Then we see that all nations will submit to Christ's authoritative reign as this is his inheritance from the Father, according to Psalm 2 and Isaiah 2, 2 through 4, and Christ's reward for his church. Revelation 5.10 tells us that, that you and I will rule and reign as a kingdom of priests alongside of him. So it's Christ's inheritance from the Father for him to rule in this authoritative reign on earth, and it is your and my responsibility to rule and reign with him. And so Christ's reward to us is a reward of this rulership. Then we see that Christ will reign supreme on the earth as triumphant king in the same arena where he seemed defeated by the rulers of this world who rejected his authority. Isaiah 49, 5 through 7, Micah 4, 3 through 4, 1 Corinthians 2, 8, 1 Corinthians 5, 15, 24 through 28. I want you to see all these verses, and I've given all of these for you so that you can go back. I, I believe it would take me a month to go back and go through these two parts of this incredible feast and look. I want you to look at every scripture because you have read these scriptures, but you didn't know where they fit. And so when you can go back and put together this beautiful puzzle, you'll, you'll see all that the Lord has already told us will be true. So it will be a righteous rule. Next, it will be a redemptive rule. So Israel will complete their ministry to the Lord and mission to draw the nations, redeeming their purpose. So Isaiah 61, 6, 66, 19 through 21 tells us this. Israel will be a main feature as they perform their priestly duties in the temple of the Lord from Jerusalem as they take on all of the things that God called them to do initially because the commission was given to them first at Sinai 
It was given to Abraham first to be the father of many nations, but then it was given to God's people that they would establish a land where they would live in such a way that the nations would see that God is the Lord. And they didn't end up living up to that. And so then the Great Commission was a restated mission to us as the church to go forth into all the world and do the same. And so Israel will live up to their purpose, completing the work that God has for them. That's why the Feast of Tabernacles is also called the Feast of the Nations. And I want to remind you that it is our commission as well, and that's what you and I are to do until the Lord comes, that all may know him. Then we see that all the earth will come to worship the king in Jerusalem during this time and appear for the Feast of Tabernacles every year, redeeming the worth of the lamb before the world. Obviously, the worth of the lamb is imperishable, and precious beyond means, but we will put on display the worth of the lamb before the world, and they will acknowledge the worth of all that he has done. We see this in Zechariah 14, 16 through 17. This stumps us sometimes, but it is a truth from the scriptures. Sacrifices will still be offered as a remembrance of Christ's offering, and also because sin will still exist. So the temple will need cleansing and those coming to worship, atonement or mercy, redeeming pure worship. So just like Israel was covered in mercy at the, at the mercy seat of the Lord on the Ark of the Covenant until a day when they will receive the grace of Jesus Christ, all of those who are born during the millennium and come up who have not yet accepted Christ as Lord will need a covering of mercy to appear before him, to come into his presence, so sacrifices are offered as that same Old Testament paradigm and picture until the time that they will be redeemed. And because it is an imperfect world, those ashes of the red heifer that we see in the Old Testament that cleanse the temple mount, that cleanse the, the holy utensils, uh, all of those things will still go on because we're still living uh, on imperfect soil, so to speak, in an imperfect will, world that is soiled by sin. So you can, again, see all of those things unfold in Isaiah 56, Jeremiah 33, Ezekiel 45. I'll describe those things. And then I want you to see in this redemptive rule that Satan will be bound for most of the thousand years, then loosed at the end for one final rebellion, so that all who were born during the millennium have to choose to be saved by Christ or perish in their sin. Then comes the final judgment, redeeming the loss. This gives them an opportunity before the great white throne judgment that's talked about in Revelation 19 and 20. Fascinating to me. Only the redeemed go into the millennium, surrounded by servants of the Lord and saints who have come back uh, after the rapture, come back to rule and reign on the earth. Israel that's being restored, fulfilling their mission. You and I as believers who will come back to rule and reign with Christ. We have an imperfect world that is not yet recreated, but we all know the Lord to begin with, and all of these kids will be born during the millennium. And many will, with their mouth, confess Christ, but will not live as if he is real, and they will rebel against him at the end of the millennium. A great number of people. And it just reminds me of the power of that original sin and how you and I have a propensity toward resistance and rebellion, and we need to ask ourselves where we stand in that sense. So we see it's a righteous rule. We see it's a redemptive rule. It is also going to be a restorative rule. So the future kingdom will have two distinct phases, the earthly kingdom or the millennium and the eternal kingdom. Restoration will be partial during the millennium as there will still be sin and death, but perfect in the eternal kingdom, as there is no longer any curse. So your books and chapters to look at this are Isaiah 11, Isaiah 64 through 66, Zechariah 12 through 14, Amos 9, Joel 2, and Revelation 20 through 22. All describe this restorative rule of Christ during the millennial kingdom and then in the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth that follow in eternity. So when I look at this reality that Christ is coming back to rule and reign, that I am coming back to rule and reign with him, I need to ask some heart questions. 
about how I am allowing him to rule and reign in my life now. So what is my response to his rule? On that day when he returns, uh, Jesus said, nor will people say, it, here it is or there it is, meaning the kingdom, because the kingdom of God is within you. It's in you. And that means that you carry that with you now. So the next question I would ask myself is, is his kingdom my priority? Jesus said in Matthew 6, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Do you not realize that is to be my priority right now in my life? Do you know what your future job description is? According to Revelation 5 and 10, you are a kingdom, priests who reign on the earth. That's what you'll be doing. Revelation 3.21 says he'll share his throne with you. Let me say that again. He'll share his throne with you. And that's why Christ said in Luke 16.10, he who is faithful with little, I will make faithful with much. Whatever you do now for the Lord and are faithful in, he transfers to your account for the day that you will rule and reign and represent him as judges of the earth. In fact, this is what Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians 6, 2, when he said, you will judge the world. And then he asked the Corinthians, are you not competent to judge trivial cases now? Are you not practicing that skill set right now? Are you not seeking for the wisdom of the Lord to factor in how you live and judge things now? Is his kingdom my priority? And am I preparing for that great task by being faithful in the tasks he gives me now? And then I have to ask, is he precious to me? He must reign during this coming kingdom, but he also must be honored according to Zechariah 14 and 17. So do I honor him today in the way I allow him to reign in me? Am I fully surrendered to all that he is and all that he has for me? And am I producing fruit in keeping with his kingdom? So Romans 14, 17 tells us what that fruit is. And I'm not talking about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, though a couple of these are. This is what is the fruit of the kingdom? Romans 14, 17 says the kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Are these things evident as I rub shoulders with those who don't yet know the Lord, that they see this kingdom presence in me and that I am full of righteousness, peace, and joy? Then do I live in kingdom power? And I love this. I was so challenged and convicted by this when I read this. 1 Corinthians 4.20 for the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. That word is dunamis, dynamite. Is the dynamite power of the Lord evident in you? Not just the talk that comes out of your mouth. The power of the Lord that extends through you to others. And then do I live in the light of his kingdom authority in me now? John 1.12 says, as many as received him, he gave power to become the children of God. Now that word power is not the same word as dunamis. It's not the dynamite. It is the Greek word exousia, and it means delegated authority or influence. So what was said of our salvation was as many as would receive Christ, to them would be given the delegated authority to influence the world. Are you living forth that delegated authority? Are you mantled with all that God has given you in order to um, achieve Christ's mission now, which is to bring his redemptive rule to people's lives? What a powerful picture this gift of rulership is. And I have a lot to sit with right there before the Lord and ask myself, surrendering whatever I need to surrender to let him be the sovereign of my life and to rule and reign in a powerful way that is undeniable to the people around me. The sixth gift that we see in this great feast is the gift of restoration. We see this all through the prophets and we marvel at how the world will be restored first in the millennial kingdom and then finally and perfectly in eternity. 
But look at what Isaiah 9, 7 says. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. So he's going to restore in several different ways. And the first I want you to see is the restoration of creation. All of us watch creation literally groaning in these days with hurricanes and floods and fires devastating the earth with pollution <coughs> that is taking away the purity of our ecosystems. But look at what Romans 8, 20 through 22 says. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And so during the millennial kingdom, the Lord Jesus will begin to restore creation. And we see this in a, a number of different ways. There will be the taming of the animal kingdom where they will not be predatory anymore. We see that when we hear that um, animals will lie down together and not devour one another. There will be a cessation of conflicts between nations, between people. There will be a restoring of destroyed lands and seas. Disease and deformity will be greatly diminished. Remember, people will die during the millennium, but many will die of old age. And the scriptures tell us that a youth will be considered young at the age of 100. So we know that lifespans will be greatly extended again. People will be profitable in the work that they do. There will be productive work rather than war. There will be a flourishing of nature. You can find all of that detailed in Isaiah 11, 29, 30, 35, 30, uh, 33, 35, 65, and Jeremiah 31. You have heard many of those verses before, but if you will go back and read these chapters, you will see this Feast of Tabernacles unfold and what it's going to look like in the coming kingdom. And then we're going to see the restoration of Israel. This is a main feature of the millennial kingdom. Now look at what Romans eleven twelve 12 says. But if their Israel's transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their fullness bring? When Paul describes to us that you and I as Gentile believers have been grafted into Israel in Romans 9 through 11, that Israel didn't fulfill their purpose, but because they didn't walk in it, you and I are brought into the kingdom of God. And you and I get to walk in the fullness that was meant for God's chosen people originally, all of us together now being chosen before him, Israel, when they are restored to him in their fullness. There are many Jewish Christians today, and that's a beautiful thing. They are completed in their faith. That is like double portion blessing. But this will happen in his coming kingdom in such a rich way. And what Paul's saying here is, if they're lost, the fact that they didn't walk in salvation and receive Christ in grace, if, if that became your gain because he came to the Gentiles and now you have been enriched in him, how much more will that be true in the coming kingdom when their riches will mean greater fullness for you? And so we will see that in the coming kingdom. I love what Thomas Ice and Timothy Demi say in Prophecy Watch. The church and the nations, Gentiles, will be present and active during the millennium, but the focus of prophetic revelation is on Israel and Christ. That is why we can never say in our theology that the church has replaced Israel. It has not. There is so much of the Bible that speaks to how Israel will be restored during this time. And so we see the restoration of Israel as a main feature of this coming millennial kingdom. In fact, the Feast of Tabernacles is also called the Feast of Ingathering because they will be gathered back to the land, gathered back to the Lord during this time. So how will we see the restoration? We see it in the regeneration of their hearts, according to Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. We see it in the regathering from the nations to their promised land in Isaiah 11, 11 through 12, verse 6. We see it in the repossession of the land that Ezekiel 36 talks about. And then we see it in the reestablishment of the throne of David, as David will sit as co-regent with Christ, ruling and reigning, as his kingdom, the kingdom of David, was an everlasting kingdom. God gave him that promise. And then we will see it in the restoration of the holy priesthood of the Levites, Israelites, who will serve the Lord in the temple. We see that in Jeremiah 33. 
17 through 26, the restoration of Israel. Not only will the Lord restore creation, restore Israel during this time, but there will be a restoration of fellowship. So God will restore everything that was lost to us in the Garden of Eden. And many features of the garden and heaven will be seen again. So if you read these great chapters in Ezekiel 47 and Revelation 21 and 22, you'll see this. His throne will be with us again. His presence, the Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The glory of God will canopy us. The Lamb will be the light. There will be a river of living water. The tree of life will be there. There will be constant fruit on that tree as there was constant fruit in the Garden of Eden. And then there will be a holy community that will be one with one another and one with the Lord, just as Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the day again. So we will have a beautiful restoration during that time, but just a reminder to you right now that he wants a restoration for you in your life now. You picture this, you picture what's coming in the kingdom in the way that God restores your life in whatever way it's broken. And the first thing he wants is he wants you freely restored, freely. This is what Isaiah 61, 1 through 4 says. And we're going to unpack these verses next week when we talk about the year of Jubilee. I am so excited about that message. We don't understand the year of Jubilee, but it pictures for us everything that Jesus won for us on the cross that you and I can walk in now and everything that is coming in the coming kingdom. And so it matters. He wants you freely restored. He also wants you fully restored. He wants you new through and through. So I love this word, baptizo, in the New Testament Greek. It's the word for baptism. And it literally means dipped and dyed, like a, a, like a cloth that's dipped and dyed and becomes something completely different. That is the word for baptism, and that was the picture. You go down into the waters in the death of Christ, and you come out in the life of Christ completely brand new, just like he was restored in his resurrection, completely brand new. You are, in fact, a new creation. All things are new in you, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says. The Greek wording in that passage is sparkling new superior like the new heavens and the new earth a total metamorphosis or transformation the lord wants that for you now he doesn't say you're going to get that someday in the coming kingdom he says you are that now and so you picture that in ephesians 2 10 paul said that you are a new masterpiece of the lord you are christ's workmanship created in christ jesus to do good works that were pre prepared beforehand that you would walk in them. That word in that verse, workmanship, is, is the Greek word uh, poemia. It's the word for poem. It's a, it's a beautiful, artful, masterful piece. God artfully has created you in Christ Jesus for masterful works that are unlike anybody else in this entire world. You are the only one who is this poem of God that goes everywhere that you go and shines forth and speaks forth who he is. And he has already prepared good works for you to walk in. So reflect who you really are. Be who you were created to be, and then be who you were newly created to be in Christ. I love this picture of the gift of restoration in this feast. And then we see the gift of rejoicing, the seventh gift, and such an incredible ending gift for us. In fact, God commanded his people to be joyful, expressively joyful at this feast. Look at what Deuteronomy 16, 14, and 15 say. Be joyful at your feast, you, your sons and daughters, your men servants and maidservants, and the Levites, the aliens, the fatherless, and the widows who live in your towns, even those who are grieving, be joyful. Why? For the Lord your God will bless you in all your harvest and in all the work of your hands, and your joy will be complete. So we see incredible rejoicing through this feast. Rejoicing was seen in the message to the shepherds at Jesus' birth and in the name of this feast, which is the season 
of our joy. That's what they call it. We see it as the angels gave the message to the shepherds in Luke 2.10. And the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. So God commanded his people to rejoice the whole time of this feast, not to stop. The word in the Hebrew means to be filled with glee, gladness, be merry, brighten up, to celebrate each year and forever. In fact, again, if you look closer at some of those Hebrew words for joy in that passage, they mean to be giddy and dance, reel to and fro. Be before the Lord in great joy. Revelation, or I'm sorry, Leviticus 23, 40, and 41 describe those joyous celebrations. Then we see that rejoicing was fitting for the best birthday party ever, forever celebrating God's Son. I've told you already, services happened every day of this feast, a parade every day, a party every night with those giant menorahs that were lighted, men danced while juggling flaming torches, and they had music day and night. There was nothing like the revelry that happened during this feast. In fact, the Jewish people, the rabbis say that if you, if you haven't seen joy, you haven't seen it until you've been at a Feast of Tabernacles. And so they were completely given to this party day and night. I think there was actually a happy birthday song that was sung each day of the feast to Jesus. We find it in Psalm 118. And remember, the reason I say that is because Jesus' name, Yeshua, in the Hebrew means Jehovah's salvation. It literally means salvation. So when you see salvation in the Old Testament, it's, it's Jesus. It's Yeshua. It's his actual name. And so look at what the people sang every single day of this feast. From Psalm 118, the Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation, my Jesus, my Yeshua. The voice of rejoicing and salvation, Jesus, is in the tabernacles of the righteous. I will praise you for you have become my salvation, Yeshua, Jesus. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. They spoke the name Yeshua or Jesus over and over and over again through this feast for a week. They sang about it. They watched the pictures unfold before them of all that he would do for them. And so I think the father built in to the birthday party of his son, not only his birth, but all of these expressions celebrating the birthday of Jesus. Then there was to be rejoicing in God's everlasting kingdom to come. Look at what Isaiah 35, 10 says, And the ransomed of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing, Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. You will see this over and over in the prophets. No more tears, no more crying, no more mourning, for the former things are passed away. You are to take great hope and joy in that. So when they would see this, this gave them great hope. It gave them focus during difficult times. It gave them strength, and it gave them joy. Then there was rejoicing in worship. Remember, Solomon's temple was dedicated at this Feast of Tabernacles in 2 Chronicles 7 through 9. And Solomon's temple was dedicated with 120 trumpets, with the singing of songs, cymbals, stringed instruments, and harps. That is when the glory fell from heaven and filled the temple so that even the priests could not stand and minister, according to 2 Chronicles 7, 1 through 9. So during this feast each year, singers lined the temple steps with the music of trumpets, all kinds of musical instruments, and harps. In fact, there was a hymnal for this feast. And if you want to read the songs, they are Psalm 90 through 119 and Psalm 145 through 150. I know of really uh, no other songs that were dedicated to any other feast with the same propensity that these songs were dedicated to this Feast of Tabernacles. Look at some of the phrases. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord, Psalm 95. Sing to the Lord all the earth, Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song, Psalm 98. Shout for joy. Come before the Lord with singing, Psalm 100. I will sing of your love and justice, Psalm 101. 
Sing to him, tell of all his wonderful acts. Psalm 105. I will sing and make music with all my soul. Psalm 108. Great singing during this time. And you know what? The pandemic has stolen our breath. We are told we can't sing. We wear masks and can't breathe. Uh, our lungs have been filled, not just with the possibility of COVID-19, but with the smoke that has filled our nation from the fires that have burned out of control. And God wants us to sing. God wants us to make melody in our hearts and to let our mouths express the joy of the Lord. And I think one of the things we can do to foil the enemy in these days is to worship the Lord and do it with singing. So let your voice be heard and let it ring with joy as a picture of this great feast. And then there was rejoicing in the word. Look at what Nehemiah 8, 8 through 11 says. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. Then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, this day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. So for hundreds of years, the scrolls had been pushed away and they didn't read God's word. And then they found these scrolls and brought them out and they read them to all of the people. And they wept when they realized that they were not keeping this Feast of Tabernacles. And so in the book of Nehemiah, they keep it again for the first time in hundreds of years. And we'll see what happens in a moment when I explain that to you a little bit more. But the eighth day of this feast then is designated as a Sabbath rest as God's people rest in the Lord, read from the scrolls, and rejoice in the gift of God's word to them personally. It's called Simchat Torah. They turn the Torah, that's their term, reading the last chapter of Deuteronomy and then the first chapter of Genesis in order to teach their children that all of God's word should always be read. Now, if you and I were going to turn the Torah for us today in keeping with this feast, right? The Torah to them was Genesis through De Deuteronomy, but we have Genesis through Revelation. So when we turn the Torah before our children, we would read the last chapter of Revelation, Revelation 22, and then the first chapter of Genesis saying to our children and our grandchildren, all of God's word matters. All of God's word is profitable. All of God's words should be read all of the time. What a beautiful picture they were passing on from generation to generation. Then each person had the opportunity to dance with a scroll as they rejoice in the gift of God's word to them. And here are pictures today of God's people dancing with the scrolls all over the world, in Jerusalem, in the streets of New York, uh, at the Western Wall, and I love this picture of this little boy holding his scroll and dancing before the Lord as he holds God's word in his hands and says, this is for me. This is precious to me. And wow, I love the statement that that makes. And I wish we had something like this so that we could fully appreciate all that he has given us in that. Did you know that more scripture is read during this feast and more teaching done about the scriptures than at any other feasts? And this is why Jesus taught more at this feast than he did at others, teaching specific truths about himself that matched the themes of Sukkot. You'll see that in John 7 and 8 and 9. If you want to understand, now that you've studied the Feast of Tabernacles, what Jesus was saying and what he was doing during this feast. Read John 7, John 8, and John 9. All three chapters take place at just one Feast of Tabernacles. In the same way, truth will be taught in his coming kingdom. This will be a feature of the coming kingdom. Look at Zechariah 8, 3. This is what the Lord says. I will return to Zion and dwell in Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth and the mountain of the Lord Almighty will be called the holy mountain. Don't you long for a city of truth? Don't you long for the truth of the Lord to go forth in power across the earth? There, there was rejoicing in the word of God. Then there was rejoicing in the bounty of the Lord. 
Remember, this was a Thanksgiving feast. This was the end of their final harvest when they said thank you to the Lord for all the bounty that he had given them. Look at what Jeremiah 31, 12 says. They will come and shout for joy on the heights of Zion. They will rejoice or be radiant in the bounty of the Lord, the grain, the new wine, and the oil, the young of the flocks and herds. God wants that spirit of thanksgiving in our home, in our heart. I love that Israel has a year-round harvest calendar of thanksgiving, starting with Passover, seven feasts, including a weekly feast of Sabbath, that they worship the Lord and thank him for all the benefits that he gives to them, ending with this great feast of all feasts, great gratefulness. Billy Sunday has said, if there is no joy in your religion, there's a leak in your Christianity somewhere. And I think, especially in this difficult season, finding ways to express gratefulness to the Lord is so good, not just for our hearts, for our spirits, it's good for our emotions, it's good for our minds. Because in this time, the world has taken us down to the mat. And every way that you can find gifts of gratefulness, do you know that God has so blessed us during this season? There have been blessings we didn't even anticipate that we needed that have happened because of this pandemic. And God wants us to be in a constant state of gratefulness. Then there was rejoicing because the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Look at what Isaiah 65, 17 through 19 says. Behold, I will create a new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a delight, a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. This is what is pictured in Christ's very first miracle in John 2, which is actually called a sign when he turned water to wine. What was the point of the sign? That in the coming kingdom, the best will be last. I am saving the best for last. So in God's kingdom, old things pass away and all is made new. Death leads to life, mourning or sorrow to joy growing old to youth being renewed. And that's what we have to look forward to. As Rabbi Jonathan Kahn has said, the ways of God all lead to joy and the best he saves for last. What an incredible time that will be. So as we look at all of this rejoicing, just from cover to cover rejoicing during this feast, I have to ask you, how is this sense of great joy evident in you, in your life right now? Look at what Isaiah 12, 4 and 5 says. In that day, you will say, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known among the nations what he has done, and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Did you see that? In that day, you will say, it will be evident in you one day. What about this day? So let this joy strengthen you in every season, especially a season of sorrow or sighing. I referred to Nehemiah and how the people reread the book of the law. They realized they hadn't kept the Feast of Tabernacles. They wept and Nehemiah said, don't weep. Let's keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This is where this great verse comes, and you may not associate it with the Feast of Tabernacles or that sense. But look at what Nehemiah 8.10 says. Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks. That's rich dessert and Starbucks. And send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Did you know that's where that phrase came from? It's from this Feast of Tabernacles and the sense that all of us should celebrate it with great joy. And when you are in a sorrowful season, when you are in a place of darkness, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And I love that they ate great things during this feast. Choice food in the Hebrew literally means fatty foods. Go and eat fatty foods. <laughs> 
because fat in God's kingdom is a source of that oil is, is abundance to the Lord. Go eat fatty foods and drink sweet drinks. Get your fill of them in celebration for all that God has done. Well, as we wrap up today, I want to say, may our hearts be tuned to the joy to the world as we await his coming. You may not realize that, but when Handel wrote this great song, it was not written to be celebrated at Christmas. It did not convey the birth of Christ. It conveyed the kingdom of Christ to come. It was written about the millennium. And so let me read these words to you because you will sing them in a few weeks. And I hope any time you hear joy to the world from now on, you will not look to a stable where a baby lay. You will look to a soon coming king who will rule and reign. Listen to these words. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the savior reigns. Let men their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. No more curse. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love. That is the coming kingdom. And may his kingdom come to you today as you celebrate and live in light of this feast every day. So the feast to end all feasts is pictured in detail in Isaiah 12, just six verses. But it ends with this verse, Isaiah 12, 6. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. In your midst, tabernacling. But I remember that when Jesus came, the Word was made flesh and dwelt, tabernacled among us, and we beheld His glories of the only begotten of God, full of grace and truth. There was no room in the inn. There was no room for Him. And I think about this phrase in Joy to the World, let every heart prepare him room. There was no room in the end, but is there room in your life? Let every heart. How can you let your heart prepare him room? By letting him revive you. Asking for that. For that fresh wind and the refreshing rain and the fresh fire. By letting him rule in your life by surrendering all to him, making sure there's nothing you are resisting or holding back from him, by letting him restore you now freely and fully, and by rejoicing in all he is, all he has done, and all he will do. Will you let his kingdom come in a fuller way in your heart today? This doesn't always happen to me although the Lord always gives me all of my messages. But as I was preparing this message for you, the Holy Spirit spoke three things he wanted for you through this feast as I share. The first was that you would feel enfolded, knowing just how much God loves you and longs to wrap you in his grace and glory. Just as the shepherds were surrounded with his glory, just as the disciples were surrounded with his glory, that you would feel a heavenly hug. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High abides in the shadow of his wings, that you would feel that. I love when they make these sukkahs. You, you can see in this picture, they put a crown at the top of the sukkah to remember that, that the Lord is crowned. But look at how intimate this tent is because it's the intimacy, it's the relationship that he wants. And he wants you to feel enfolded in understanding the beauty of this feast, the beauty of him coming to be among you, in you, in your midst, in the middle of your life. The second thing the Holy Spirit showed me was that he, he wanted you to feel encouraged, especially as you see the day of his coming getting near. That's what Paul told us. Encourage one another, especially as you see the day draw near. That means you and I should be encouraging each other like we have never encouraged each other before. 
walk forward, walk in faith, walk in great power in these days because he is soon returning. And the third thing is that you would feel empowered to be all that he made you to be, that your life would be dynamite as you go forth in resurrection power, that you would understand that you are delegated authority of Christ everywhere that you go in order to influence this world. So please remember how you live your, your life now will determine what you will be entrusted with in his coming kingdom. So be wise and walk in his fullness as you wait for him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the fullness of this feast. Wow, so many gifts you have given us the gift of relationship, the way that you want to be in our midst, to be with us, Emmanuel, come. The redemption that you demonstrated through all that Christ would give us through the cross. Thank you for the blood of Jesus and all that he has given so that I can receive and be your child. For the rest of Sabbath, for the peace that will come in the coming kingdom and for the peace that lives in me because you are full in me today. And Father, thank you for these gifts we've unwrapped and looked at closer today, the gift of revival. Holy Spirit, come with great power. Pour out the Lord's presence through us to the ends of the earth in these days. I pray that you would come with a fresh wind. I pray that you would fill our temples to overflowing, that you would bring the refreshing rains of your spirit and your living water. And Father, that there would be fresh fire, that you would fall upon the altar of our hearts and that we would burn brightly. Don't whine, shine in these dark, dark days. Thank you for the gift of rulership and I pray that each of us would take those questions and sit before you and ask, are you reigning supreme in every place in our life? Do the people around us know that you are our King? Thank you for the gift of restoration. And I pray that you would continue to do a good work in us, that you will complete in the coming of Christ Jesus, but that you would rebuild and restore us in every broken down place. That we would be your masterpiece, that our lives would demonstrate that you are a God, not just of redemption, but of restoration. And thank you for the gift of rejoicing, Father. Thank you that your joy is our strength. May it be our strength in these days. And may we rejoice in your word. May we worship you with great joy. May we sing the praises of our coming King. Father, as we await that day, may you fill us to overflowing and may we shout in our actions, in our attitudes, and in our words, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive glory and honor and majesty. We long for your coming. We are watching for your appearing. Father, make us truly and fully yours in these days. In Jesus' name, amen.